This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Hey there, mom and daughter fighting listeners. Before the show gets started, I wanted to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. Since 2020, they've partnered with Girls Inc., an organization focused on the holistic development of girls and inspiring a new generation to be strong, smart, and bold. From March 1st to the 31st, you can support Girls Inc. by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. These funds will help support Girls Inc. STEM and college and career readiness programming. Stick around to hear from Nellie, a Girls Inc. program facilitator and trusted mentor to the girl she serves. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Monday, March 6th, the To Leash or Not To Leash edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Karen Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who is just about 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 10, Oliver, who's 8, and Teddy, who's 6. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm Lizzie O'Leary, the host of the Slate podcast, What Next TBD, and I am mom to Sam, who is two and a half, and we live in Brooklyn. Today on the show, we've got a very interesting question. When, if ever, are toddler leashes okay? Then we've got a very interesting but heavy conversation about a resonant piece in The Guardian. The article is all about how parenting has changed the way the author, and honestly, some of us, think about tragedy. Then we'll end on a positive note with a round of recommendations. So don't go anywhere. Hey there, mom and dad are fighting listeners. Let's talk about Etsy. Etsy is a global marketplace for unique and creative goods. There's no warehouse, just millions of people worldwide buying and selling the things that they love. So if you're looking for beautifully made items from independent sellers, check out Etsy. Etsy sellers have everything from statement pieces like rugs and sofas to daily staples like outerwear and accessories. So whether you're a fashionista in the market for a vintage coat or a homeowner looking for a handmade cutting board, Etsy is the place to go. Etsy is committed to promoting creativity and fostering human connections so you can feel good about the purchases you make. Shop jackets, jewelry, furniture, art, and more made for all budgets and any occasion. New to Etsy? Use the code NEW for 10% off your first purchase. That's code NEW. Maximum discount of $50. Offer ends June 30th, 2023. See terms at etsy.com slash terms. For home, style, and gifts, shop etsy.com. Etsy has it. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all. What's up? It's your girl, Lene Vanee. I'm a writer, creator, and a change maker. Whether putting art out into the world or being an agent for social change, I'm always learning. Take it from me. Tech savvy and business skills are just as important as passion and creativity. That's why I am so excited to tell you about Macy's support of Girls, Inc. It's an organization that creates safe spaces for girls to navigate economic and social barriers, to grow up healthy, educated, and independent. This mission is something Nellie knows quite a bit about. My name is Nellie Washington, and I am a program facilitator for Girls Inc. of Long Island. Being a big sister, being a mentor, every day is different with these girls. We talk about everything from self-esteem, self-motivation, self-love. We have summer camps where our girls are able to learn engineering and science. Our girls are building robots. They're connecting with different people in the STEM field. Macy's, they are really what help us do the work that we do. Now these girls have another view of what's possible for them. 
the impact is far beyond what we can even imagine. Now's the time to support Girls, Inc. and empower a new generation of leaders. This March, Women's History Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund Girls, Inc. STEM and college career readiness programs. Give back and learn more at Macy's.com slash purpose. All right, we're back and ready to hear our question. Hi, mom and dad are fighting. I love the show and I've been listening ever since before I had my kid. My question is, are toddler leashes bad? Before I became a parent, I'm sure I thought I would never. And I feel like they generally seem frowned upon. But what do you do when you have a toddler who hates the stroller and absolutely refuses to hold hands? I patiently explain why and offer alternatives like holding onto my jacket, etc., but trying to force hand-holding instantly triggers a full-on meltdown, which just doesn't feel worth it. Right now, I can pick her up if needed, like when crossing the street, but in a couple of months, that won't be an option. I'm pregnant with our second kid, and since this is a high-risk pregnancy, I won't be able to lift her after the first trimester. So I need to get some advice on how to get my daughter to hold hands, whether it involves a toddler hardness or something else. I typically aspire to practice respectful slash positive parenting, but this is truly a safety issue, both for my daughter and myself. Recently, I've been Googling cute toddler leashes in hopes of finding something that won't make me feel like a bad parent or get weird looks from strangers. Help. To leash or not to leash. Hmm. Okay. (laughs) So I want to say I am anti-leash with the caveat that I think a lot of parents don't know what else to do. And I, that is why the leash was invented. And I completely get that. And I'm not sure that there's anything out there that says you're, you're actually doing any kind of harm by leashing your toddler. But for me, and I had, uh, one of the kids was a bolter. Um, and so I definitely feel like I considered it with all the travel, like what options do I have to kind of keep this kid here? But fundamentally I felt like the leash was not going to teach them to, hold hands or to be better. It was going to be a stopgap for managing the situation, but I was still eventually going to have to teach them. It is a lot of work to teach a toddler, particularly one that wants to bolt or, you know, run away or be away from you or exert that power that it's important that we are, we always called it like, you're not voice trained yet. (laughs) You know, like I need to know that when I, when I yell stop, that you will stop. And once we can do that, your leash gets a lot longer, like in terms of that, you don't necessarily have to hold my hand. Cause I know you're going to wait at every street, or I know you're going to do these certain steps that keep us safe. So for me, it's like, If you have this high risk pregnancy and you do not know what else to do and all you're thinking is, I just need a leash to manage this situation, that's a fine way to handle it. But I don't know that you are fixing the problem so much as delaying the inevitable in terms of teaching them like, hey, we have to hold hands or you're just going to have to ride in the stroller. So I was thinking about this because this, it feels very resonant with my life. I have a two and a half year old. We live in Brooklyn. We live right by Flatbush Avenue, like very big street, um, and we have to cross it a lot. It's in between us and preschool. We have to cross it to get to the public library, to get to the park, like all the places we go all the time. And so we have done a lot, a lot, a lot of practicing. Liz, like what you're talking about, the practicing, walking together, practicing, stopping, Um, Sam will bolt, and it has scared the shit out of me. The two things that I think have actually helped us are games, like uh, doing a sort of almost a red light, green light, right? Like getting him really involved in working on letting his body go and letting his body stop. And like, how quickly can you stop your body? What does your body Mm. do when I say stop? Um, He gets excited by that. The other thing is holding something together like he loves to hold the rainbow rope when the preschoolers all go out for a walk (laughs) when they look like a tiny little chain gang and so something that might be an in-between like is it a a belt a tie a bathrobe loop like something that they can hold together and then explaining like we're doing this because we are practicing keeping you safe those are cars that's not safe the sidewalk is safe this is why we stay here 
where do you see that's safe? Like, it's, you know, it's like slow, tedious practice. But I think you're right in that the leash might solve the immediate problem, but it doesn't actually build the long-term solution. So I have to uh, admit that, and I, it's probably been a while since we've talked about this on here, I am pro-leash. <laughs> I was a leash parent. We were also living in Brooklyn at the time. And there was a very funny picture of Naima when she has to be maybe three. And we're at the Brooklyn Museum. And there was this exhibit or this installation, rather, where there were all these skateboards covered with prayer cloths. And they were on the floor, like 50 skateboards, you know, and like they don't have a barrier in between the public and the skateboards. They just have lines drawn on the floor that you're not to cross. Right. Mm -hmm. And so Naima keeps like stepping her foot over the line. You know, I'm like, no, Naima, like we can't. And like, I had to literally like rein her in like a Oh, she was on the leash during this? She was on the leash. (laughs) She was on the leash. And so like, there's this, like this girl just snapped the funniest picture of like, Naima's like on the floor being gently pulled back away (laughs) from the chaos that she was about to unleash upon this museum. And I'm just sitting there looking like, I don't know. And I saw the girl snap the picture and she was like, I'm so sorry. It was so funny. I was like, it's fine. Can you send it to me? <laughs> um, oh, that was very that's cool of because I might have lost it at that. I can't tell. Either would have been like, that's really funny or like, bugger off, lady. It was so much. I think the girl was really young. So it's part of the reason I didn't get to annoy. Like, feel like if it had been like a 40 or 50 year old, I might have been like, you're supposed to be on my side yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, it was like a young girl. But um, I found, you know, there were times where Naima would run. She was usually a pretty good hand holder, but I felt in crowds, you know, like with all the street crossing that we had to do because we were pedestrians and taking the train up Mm -hmm. and down the stairs. I liked the security that I got from leashing. I didn't do it often, you know, like there were not a lot of leash occasions, but there were a few and they were noteworthy. And when I think of that, I'm so grateful that I had that leash on that day. I just think it depends on the circumstances. And I realize that it's not a forever solution and that you're not well, teaching. Right. She's, not, she, she's not still leashed. <laughs> she's not still leashed. She's free now. It clearly turned out um, okay. She turned out fine. You know, and I think that like it depends. Like, I think the leashes are fine if you need them, you know, and if you can find something else that works better then do that. But I think under these circumstances, first of all, stop picking her big ass up now. Don't wait until the second trimester. <laughs> Just stop now, you yeah. know, like it, it's it's not worth the risk. You know, if this is a high risk pregnancy, be gentle with yourself. And I think one of the ways that you can be gentle with yourself, mm. we had the very cute backpack. It looks like an animal backpack. It was adorable. You know, it came with a teddy bear. Find a cute little leash and leash your child up with no shame. Forget anybody that looks at you crazy, you know, because you know what you've got to do to keep your child safe. Like, again, I could see if you were like, oh, you know, my child typically holds my hand and doesn't run off from me, but I just feel like I could use an extra level of security. Like, I could understand, you know, that feeling a little questionable about it, but like, you're knowing that this child is a flight risk and that you and that do not you're have in a the, vulnerable position. You're in a vulnerable position. I think these are extreme circumstances. And I think that these are certainly, mm-hmm. you know, worth it. And I will say, like, I had, I forgot which one of my friends was like, black people don't do this, Jamila. <laughs> We, this is not us. We don't do this. And I'm like, well, guess what? We do now. I'm starting something new. But with no shame, absolutely no shame. I never felt, you know, if anyone ever looked at us, I, short of my friends, you know, staging an intervention, I don't recall it. You know, what I recall is that my child was safe and that's what matters. Can I ask if you also worked on the handholding, those sort of things, or eventually she just picked it up? Definitely. You know, like a lot of talk about safety and, you know, it's really important that you hold my hand. I have to be able to always have eyes on you. You can't get far away from me, you know, and in time she picked it up. We didn't use it long. I feel like it helps me to train her, if Mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. You know, like it helps us pick up safer habits for walking around in public 
what I feel like I'm hearing you say is like this was a tool, not a solution. And I think that's kind yeah. of what the letter writer is going for is like, can this be an acceptable tool? And given what's going on in her life, yes, absolutely. But I, yeah. I, I also am like you also, even though it sucks, probably have to work on the other stuff, too, before you have two children running away from you. Yes. To leash or not to leash, let us know what you decide. Everyone else, if you have a question for us, please send it in. Email it to us at slate.com or send us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. We're going to take a quick break. See you in a second. There's no denying that the education system in America has its flaws. It's time to work towards a better system. One, where business and politics don't drive the decision made in schools. Check out the brand new podcast, The Citizen Stewart Show. It's an inside look at the dark forces affecting our schools and our democracy, and how together we can make improvements for our kids and our country. The Citizen Stewart Show is hosted by Chris Stewart, a parent, education activist, and former school board member who's witnessed the systematic inequalities in our schools firsthand. Each week, he and co-host Ravi Gupta, former Obama staffer and superintendent of a network of charter schools in the South, dive deep into the top headlines that aren't being covered. They share an inside look at the perils and promise of education and democracy in America, with no topics off limit. Join the conversation with The Citizen Stewart Show every Tuesday on the Lost Debate Podcast Network. You can find The Citizen Stewart Show on Amazon, Spotify, Apple, YouTube, or wherever you get your shows. Thrive Market is the go-to for all grocery and household essentials, and the convenience of getting it all quickly shipped to your doorstep is a huge time saver. On top of the massive savings on each order, Thrive Market has a deals page that changes daily, gives cash back on so many brands, and they have a price match guarantee. There are over 70 filters on the website or app. Whether you're looking for certified gluten-free snacks or non-toxic cleaning essentials, you can curate your own shopping experience with the click of a button. I love Mayer hand soap, especially the lavender one. I just got a couple of those big bottles in bulk. I also got Noah, my daughter, some new conditioner with tea tree oil. It's really nice stuff. And had I gotten that at the drugstore, I would have paid so much more. Join Thrive Market today and get 30% off your first order, plus a free $60 gift. Go to thrivemarket.com slash mom and dad for 30% off your first order, plus a free $60 gift. That's T H R I V E market.com slash mom and dad. Thrive market.com slash mom and dad. As a parent, no two days are ever the same. And let's face it, sometimes a little extra help goes a really long way. That's where care.com comes in. Care.com makes it easy to find local, experienced, and background check childcare to help manage your family's ever changing needs and schedule. From nannies and babysitters to daycare centers and tutors, find help for long or short-term support at care.com. All caregivers who use care.com are required to complete a background check before they're able to interact with families on the platform. Just go to care.com and post a job for caregivers to apply. We have a really good babysitter at home, but she's a very busy high schooler, so recently I went on care.com to search for some backup. I just put in our zip code and our child care needs, and I found 151 possible matches for a babysitter. Sign up now at care.com and see why over 3 million families use this amazing platform. Get the help you need to make it all work for your family at care.com. That's care.com. So we wanted to talk about a piece in The Guardian. It was called, in my work, I see tragedy daily and think someone works so hard to keep this person alive. It's a journalist giving their perspective about covering the tragic deaths of people of varying ages and as a still someone new mother, how that makes her feel now and thinking about the fact that these people were once children, they weren't once cared for by a mother or a father and how much harder it is for her to do this sort of work now as a parent. And it really struck a chord with uh, a number of our colleagues in the Slate Parenting Slack. There was something Janae Desmond Harris said. She's dear Prudence. She says, I kind of love every baby in the world now. And I think of every adult as a grown up baby now that she's a parent. Mm. What did you all think? We'll start with you, Lizzie. I, I just I feel like this this 
piece, I don't know, it like it zeroed in on a, a particular feeling I have had since having Sam that is so like utterly banal because so many people experienced it and is yet incredibly profound of just like I have been split open and the rawest part of my emotional being or, or in some cases even my physical being is like out there in the world walking around. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that in other people now. And it's so stupid in the way that you're like, well, nobody talks about this aspect of labor. And it's like, yeah, no, everybody does. You just weren't paying attention because it wasn't relevant to you. <laughs> and I remember my mother saying, well, for the rest of your life, your heart is going to be walking around outside your body. Yep. And I, it, I think about this all the time in news stories. I've thought about it a lot in the aftermath of these earthquakes. Um, the stories of children are like extremely upsetting to me. I think about it a lot in the wake of police shootings, um, you know, usually against black men in this country. Um, I just like, I can't stop thinking about their parents' pain. I just can't stop it. And it is both, I think, like a a very difficult thing to have your brain circle around. But maybe as a journalist, it's also a really good thing to have your brain constantly come back to, to like mm. never take out the fact that you are talking to someone's child, someone's parent, someone who was like deeply, deeply loved. And I, I don't know. I feel like sometimes we obviously very easily get past that and, and shouldn't. My mom also used to say the thing about, you know, your heart lives outside your body when you become a parent. And it, you know, I truly understand that now. Um, when Naima was a baby, I was working as a news editor covering the death of Trayvon Martin. Mm. And that was devastating to me, you know, in ways that... Um, other horrific crimes like that hadn't hit me, you know, because it was the first time I could really uh, think about it from the perspective of a mother. And as this article, I want to mention the journalist's name, it's Ankita Rao. What she mentioned, I, I think the thing that we, most of us hadn't articulated or thought about before is that so much of the work of parenting is keeping a child alive. Mm. You know, yeah. for so long, yeah. particularly for the earliest years, it's like my whole job is just to keep you alive. You know, like maybe you didn't make it to school today. Maybe you didn't eat your peas. Maybe you didn't brush your teeth before bed, but I kept you alive. And so and on you some are level, safe I, in this hour, you are safe in this hour. That's my job, you know, and it's a job that you want to do for life. You know, like I, I would like to forever be committed to keeping my daughter alive or wish that somehow, you know, I had the control to do that. And the older your child gets, you know, mm. the further away from you they get. And obviously there are tragedies that befall children. We're talking about these earthquakes, you know, um, with very small people. But when you think about something awful happening to an adult, these are still somebody's baby, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and there's nothing that you can do. You know, like you can't be there. You can't stop the police officer. You can't stop the airplane. Like you have lost control. And I think that's one of the hardest things about parenting is that loss of control over your child's life, you know? And yeah. the older they get, the less of it that you control. Well, there's also this thing, and you're absolutely right. That is like, the, those are the, the poles of parenting, right? Like keeping you alive versus loss of control. And like it all exists somewhere in between. But there's this thing, and I think it can be particularly strong for journalists, but it's for everyone, called psychic numbing, where we we as people, like, can really empathize with one tragedy. But, like, if it becomes 10 people, 20 people, 100 yeah. people, or in the case of the pandemic, a million plus people yeah. in the U.S., um, our minds can't get there. And so we just kind of, I don't know, fuzz it out a little bit. For me personally, I felt like having a child— and it you know, took me a lot of work to have this kid, which I had at 44. It maybe erased some of that psychic numbing. Like it made the distance shorter. I think that might be a good thing. Well, shout out to Ankita Rao and The Guardian for a really beautiful, really poignant 
piece that resonated deeply with us. We're going to put a link to the piece in the show notes. If you read it and you have any thoughts, please email us or send a voicemail at 646-357-9318. We'd love to continue this conversation. And we're going to end today with sharing something that we're all loving. Lizzie, do you want to go first? What are you recommending? I am recommending, I don't know if you all are familiar with this. You can tell like all of my things are about very young children. Uh, The magazine Baby Bug, which... I don't know if you guys had, but it's a magazine for babies and toddlers, and I just love it. Um, our our most recent uh, issue came yesterday, and Sam thinks it's like the greatest thing in the world because a piece of mail comes for him. He loves to check the mailbox. You know, we have like a mail room, and, he, and he's like, my magazine book is here. Aww. And it's just, it comes nine times a year. It's $34. It's not too expensive. It's like, it's really inclusive. It's really charming. And they have like some predictable recurring characters and some new ones. And I love them. Like, I just absolutely love them. And they have, you know, ones for kids as they get older. But it's like truly one of my favorite things in the world is Baby Bug. This is the one that has like a little, I want to call it like a hand rhyme, right? Doesn't it like yeah. something you do with your hands? Because we still do. There was one about winter and it was about putting on your mittens. And I just remember it went like thumb in the thumb place, fingers all together. This is the way we do it in winter weather. And we still say that <laughs> when we put on our, our gloves. I just like remember the page and um, it has all kinds of cute stuff like that. Yeah. There's one, and now I'm like, I stretch my hands high, I stretch my hands wide. Now I can't remember the rest. <laughs> <laughs> We're learning. So clearly, maybe you might want to get it just for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, you don't have it to have if you're in your 40s and your brain is starting to go. <laughs> exactly. Elizabeth, what are you recommending? Okay, so last night, Jeff had this idea. We got into the hotel after this crazy travel day, and um, the kids are always kind of wild. So we had the idea to have Chat GPT do the kids' bedtime stories oh and have God. them each write one. It was so much fun. He opened up his computer, and he just told this little AI bot that is maybe going to ruin our lives. I don't know what each kid wanted to hear um, for their bedtime story and how many exact words they wanted it to be. Um, And we got some really cute, fun stories, and they were all listening to each other. And I feel like we we learned something about each of them because of what they wanted their story to be about. Um, So it's a fun thing to try it, definitely. All three of them, like, quieted down to listen. And then um, the 10-year-old chose some huge amount of words. And so, you know, 20 minutes into the story, two of them were out. It was awesome. Uh, But it was really fun, a fun thing to do. Uh, just go to chat GPT and type in <laughs> what you want and watch it write you a bedtime story. And it didn't write you anything insane or offensive? Nope. 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 I mean, we were like, write about, you know, a story for a this, you know, right. six-year-old about a dog who meets a ladybug. You know, <laughs> I'm sure that you could you could get it to. Uh, the, I guess the fun thing is it it and this is where it gets into trouble is that it learns from other things you're asking it. Mm -hmm. So as like when the 10 year old got to do his story, it was incorporating elements from the previous two stories because it's, you know, learning what you've, you've already had it talk about. Very cool. All right. Well, I'm recommending a documentary that's on Netflix. Uh, It's been there. I think it came out late last year, but I just got around to watching it. It's really great. It's called Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am. And it's a beautiful retrospective on Toni Morrison's life and work. It was made in 2019, but released last year. Uh, 2019 is when Toni Morrison passed away, but she's in the documentary. She's the lead voice and it's just really a gift to hear her reflect on her you know unique life and her Mm. work and just what an important you know American author she is um what a powerful voice and as somebody who grew up in an era where there were lots of black women writers and there's still you know a long way to go before the book publishing world is truly diversified, you know, and equitable, but 
I still could say I grew up, you know, knowing that Black women wrote books. Mm -hmm. Um, She's from a time before that. And her voice and her work have just been so essential to creating space for other Black women authors. So it's just a really, really good, uh, good watch. And with that, this episode of Mom and Dad Are Fighting is produced by Rosemary Belson and Maura Curry. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. And for Elizabeth Newcamp and Lizzie O'Leary, I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thank you for listening. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now.